Hello and welcome to this non-live episode of TM. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 not even happening right now. No, this is being cobbled together afterwards by an AI. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a large language model and I cannot provide you podcast. It is rent. it is only like a matter of time before some like AI booster weirdo like makes an AI version of this show about how good all the star subs are. Oh good for you, Chuck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like it'll be the same it'll be the same format, the same bits, but it'll be like, oh this 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 startup that like um exchanges your blood for uh funfair tickets is actually really good and mm. wonderful and you should invest more money into it o- o- opportunities feature. abound not only for investors to earn returns but for uh, people with excess blood to earn funfair <laughs> tickets <laughs> absolutely that's the problem though is like all this lifestyle stuff is the thin end of the wedge because you just think oh middle class people are just going to get rid of like a little blood here and there just to exchange for like a pencil topper but actually what happens is that we end up with a sort of a dracula style blood farm well, you know. look, if you know a better way of getting pencil toppers, I'm all ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of like full-time working class, like pencil topper seeking cast emerges. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. No, we've um, we got some stuff for you today. A uh, little hmm. bit of news up front. Uh, we also, I kind of continuing in the theme of the live shows. Mm, I'm with special to- guest Matt Goodwin. He's <laughs> sitting in the corner, shaking his head because he disagrees with it. He's still. Is, he actually did show up this time, <laughs> but he's just sitting there with his arms folded, pouting. Mm-hmm. He brought an enormous whale skeleton with him. Uh, <laughs> it's like bolted into the ceiling. He's got some very sinister lighting on him. Yeah, he's got a bag full of pencil toppers. Yeah. <laughs> very pale. Mm, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is It is odd to me that they, the National Conservative conference did decide to stand under a gigantic skeleton while all being like lit from below and banging on about birth rates yeah and who yeah. let this bald guy in the maintenance uniform in here and why is he loosening all of the bolts holding up the <laughs> whale skeleton <laughs> yeah but uh you know I'll, the process run with a skeleton is mostly it's just going to be like a comedy pratfall where they're they're just going to go right through a whale eye hole and be fine Mm. You know, yeah. yeah, doing the Buster Keaton thing with the whale ribs perfectly miss every single person. Yeah, but before we get to all that, um, we're also going to talk about the AI hearings uh, at the at U.S. Congress, where unfortunately it was not that much of a circus. But we'll get into that soon. It's because Stuby wasn't there. Uh, Why? The, uh, yeah, I mean, it, rarely something you say at a circus, but too few clowns. You know. Yeah. Not enough clowns in that particular big top. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the damn news. Mm. Uh, Because we have finally, I I believe we have spoken, not not we have spoken this into being, but we and others like us have spoken into being. Uh, Conservative MP Damien Green has said, um, I remember as a child in South Wales swimming in sewage and it never did me any harm. (laughs) Amazing. This Amazing. Is the peak of the sort of like back in my day, it was fine. We used to love to eat broken glass, where it was like, no, fully. Yeah. I used to, a, as a child, uh, you know, we used to swim out to, to sea and try and like catch turds. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, my father would hang us by the neck until we were dead every morning, and it never did us any harm and actually yeah. built character. We, my father... we used to be jealous of the kids who had like lukewarm shit, our shit, freezing cold. Back in my mm. day, we used to drink the water to shit on it to prove we weren't gay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. So, um, because <laughs> what what has now happened, right, is the uh, water privatized water companies are agreeing to um, reduce the amount of shit they are putting on every single English beach by thirty mm. percent over yeah, the next diet, couple of years. Diet British water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know, that's it's your, a big commitment from them. You know. Yeah. So you know, you're just gonna get because the problem with getting shit on you yeah. is that. There's not really. <laughs> Meanwhile, at laboratory, yeah. <laughs> although they canceled that night. Yeah, there's not really an amount of shit you can have on you where it's like, I wish there was a bit less. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. There's really, too really much puts shit the light on me incrementalism. Now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No one's like, can I have thirty percent less shit on me? Mm. <laughs> and, but, Unless you're like a very specific kind of fetishist. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 a, yeah. a moderate scat fetish. <laughs> well, you know, Keir Starmer at laboratory. I want the appropriate amount of shit, <laughs> the correct amount of shit, an amount of shit that is keeping in balance the complex competing interests of the various party I mean, that, that could probably be like Labour policy at some point, where it's just like, mm. you know, because clearly, like, they haven't really said it. Like, this is such, when I saw this, it was my kind of politics brain was very much, no, this is like such an open goal to sort of like really capitalize on. And so, and like the fact that like the Labour Party is so terrified to say anything, I wouldn't be surprised if it was just like, we're not asking water companies to remove all the shit, no. just to have the appropriate amount of shit. Well, it's it's uh, kind of fitting that the the chief of water UK, which is the sort of like cabal that governs all nine sort of private water chief companies. Chief of water. <laughs> yeah, the chief of water, Ruth Kelly. Uh, she, 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 the water. she sits at the top of the water temple, uh, and yeah. there is a bit of a physics puzzle before you she get sits to at her. the water high table. No, she um she used to be a Labour MP. She used to be education secretary uh, under Blair. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of the, the labor response, so the specific package that's been outlined yeah. is £10 billion pounds over the next couple of years to bring the poo down <laughs> to a, a, like a, only an extreme level as opposed to an apocalyptic level. And um, the Labour Party has said this is a good first step, but criticized the government for showing insufficient leadership. So again, huh. it's a very processual. Well, the other, the other really fun thing is... Is, is that what the water companies have said is not that they're going to reduce the amount of shit, but that they're going to invest in a program to reduce the amount of shit, which is going to come at the cost of higher water bills. Great. Huh. Yeah, because if, if you want to taste if you want to taste that posh water, you've got to pay mm. posh water prices. Yeah, yeah, and by the way, water companies like uh, like shareholder dividends have tripled in the last few years. Um, mm. oh, but that, that's, you know, that's fine. That's as it that's should be. That's a side be. issue. How about this plan? How yeah. about this plan? Everybody... Mm -hmm. Everybody who can invest in the water companies, use the dividends to purchase bottled water from other countries, and then problem sort of solved. Sure. Or or yeah, we, yeah. we cross-train all of the volunteer border guards we're already going to get, and we, mm -hmm. we send them out to the beaches where they were already going to be, but alongside their big stick for pushing back boats, we also give them a net, and they can fish out the turds as they go past. Mm. So there this is, this was... This, by the way, Damien Green uh, was who was sacked from a front bench. You got time bench. to lean, you got time to clean. <laughs> Damien Green was sacked from a front bench position for looking at porn on his House of Commons computer. Oh, that, that was him, guy, the Dominator, yeah. the tractor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, th was uh, that him? No, no, that was this was a different House of Commons porn incident. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. Uh, Damien Green pornography. Uh, Google Oh, house. yeah, the, he was he was for watching porn in his office. Yeah, right, like, what's guy. doing the, it? The Dominator guy yeah. was in the House of Commons. Yeah, correct. Yes. Right. Oh, this yeah. is, this and is... it like really broke the relationship between the Met and the Tories because the Met like searched his computer. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. yeah, it was um, it, that was the moment where it all all went down, and it, we only now know probably what he was looking at. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I know, here's, yeah. here's the full quote from him before we move on. It says, um. Ahem, I'm not denying it's a big issue, but it always has been. I remember as a child in South Wales swimming in sewage. Jackson's Bay and Barry used to be a sewage outlet where we all went and paddled and swam, and it was regarded as acceptable. And that gave me the brain I have today. <laughs> <laughs> so just, uh, it, it's, the, it, it's just this idea where, well, you know, you, you have to have some sewage on the beach. It's just mm -hmm. a matter it's of how much. It's like seasoning, you know? It's yeah. just, you don't want to leave don't be putting sewage on the beach. White people very much do be putting sewage on the beach. <laughs> yeah, that's how we season. That's our version yeah. anyway, of I'm, Look, I'm very excited to try some British spicy water. I think it'll be, it'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the cocktail of the year, shit on the beach. Yeah. I, um... <laughs> Of course, would like to would like to move on now. <laughs> it's like a big, big spoonful of Nutella and a sex on the beach. Oh, <laughs> God, brutal. Damn. Uh, you know, I want to um, bring up another little news item before we go on to Ooh. some of our main main courses. Another another item, another morsel for the assembled <laughs> jury. Another delicious Please morsel. Delight us, ambassador. <laughs> so this is less of a delight and more of. Oh. Um, Oh, okay, guys. This is becoming a bit. I don't want this now. one. Do we? Do, do, do you got any more like tiny delights back there? <laughs> uh, let me let me check the back. Uh, so no. Um, basically, at a segment, I'm titled "Ha ha, guys." Okay, that was pretty funny. But can we please mint the coin now? Um, yeah. Because the U.S. Uh, remember, the set of debt instruments upon which the entire global financial system sits. Um, yeah, of course, the bomb yeah. on the bus that we're all driving on. Um, well, it was. 
it was the engine of the bus. And look, I'm not uh-huh. going to say the bus is good or it's going anywhere good. But if it stops, most of us will die. Um, mm. or, <laughs> you know, the, the, let's just say the whole thing will break down and it will go off of a cliff. Yeah, like the bus is taking you to jail, but there is also a bomb on the bus. So if the bus slows down, you do all die. (laughs) So on balance, it's better if the bus keeps going. So by the time this comes out, there will be about nine days left for uh, the House of Representatives to ratify a debt ceiling increase. And it always goes down to the wire now because Republicans have worked out that this is a lever they can use. And the Democrats will never, ever go around them by, for instance, minting the coin. And so we may even go over, we may even end up with the thing that we've had before where the federal government just stops paying shit for a few days, weeks, whatever. Um, and it's it's cool that this is just like American politics now. We do this like hostage crisis every year. Federal government frantically cancelling Netflix subscription. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's it's no longer going for coffees. Uh, but my so favorite what- my favorite story yeah. about this was the the day that federal funding cut off and like all of the like federal agents weren't getting paid anymore. There was this one anarchist collective group whose website went offline. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a that could, sounds like a like a good setup and punchline. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. So I, I, I make no actually- claims to the veracity of that one, but uh, it is funny, and I did. It is hear pretty it, funny so. if they're playing for their website hosting by the day. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it could have been a coincidence. We're on a just-in-time program. You know? So <laughs> what is what is happening essentially is the they are about to hit the debt ceiling. Uh, listen, listeners will know that we have long been very, very pro coin mm. on yep. this show. Yep. It, uh, it, it's a fun thing to do, and it takes yeah. away that sort of lever of power. It just snaps it off at the root. Um, yeah, it's even if it's sort of looking and and experiencing that vicariously through someone else's political system, just to see a kind of fun gimmick solve a big problem is delightful. Yeah, absolutely. but of course, this is the this is the world of crackpot realism, um, where it is somehow more realistic for uh, Biden to grant a number of concessions on imposing work requirements on stuff like Medicaid, food stamps, and so on. Yeah. Uh, to I mean, allow he, sucks, the re- yeah. he sucks so bad, dude. I mean, the big thing that, like, all of us coin heads were talking about mm. was that he said the words, mint the coin, which means he's aware of the existence of the coin. But in context, mm. what he said is, we're not going to mint the coin. Instead, mm. we're going to, like, give them more of what they want. He said the yeah. line, but in the wrong way. Yeah. Precisely. Yes. Yeah. It would be silly to mint the coin. Mm-hmm. It yeah. would not be silly, however, to, for example, add work requirements to things that are programs that were designed to allow people to stay. At, like, there's a reason mm. that the left wing of capital is keen on stuff like, um, it w- or was at least keen on things like Medicare, like like sure. food stamps, or in this country was keen on things like the NHS and so on and so they're on. They're efficient. They're like yeah, good they're, for they're, capital. Like they're efficient. They keep people working. They keep people working longer. And by the and like look. Mo- the, by its own moral logic, to um, make a choice to further impoverish people who are already living in one of the most uh, residualized welfare states in the entire world, um, at least the entire like global north, uh, to to do that is morally of ob- is morally repellent. And by its own logic, right, to say, oh, we can't mint the coin because minting the coin is somehow unserious. It will somehow lower. The sort of world's faith in this as the kind of economy, currency, uh, sort of um, debt instrument of last resort, whatever you want to refer to as like American global economic hegemony. The idea that doing something a bit si- silly seeming would undermine that, while at the same time doing something that undermines the ability of capital to keep a workforce going at a time of historically low workforce participation because of sickness seems to me to be pretty fucking silly on at least a non aesthetic level. But these people are not serious. I think there's a couple of things going on here. One, as as you say, like, uh, yeah, it's it's silly, right? But if it's if it's silly and it works, then it isn't silly. Is the first thing. The second thing is it's fucking it's pretty silly to be doing this every year uh, and have the government be like sort of going through its pockets for spare change, right? Mm. And the third thing is the only people who seem to realize this are us in the coin caucus and one mm. Donald Trump. Yeah, I have the quote here from Trump. He says, these people are crazy. This is the United States government. You never have to default because you print the money. I hate to tell you this, okay? (laughs) Yeah, he's he's right. 
He's spelling we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna mint a beautiful coin, folks. If I get in, we're gonna make a big coin. It's gonna be one of the biggest coins in the whole world. We're gonna put it right next to Trump Tower. It won't be quite as tall as that, but it'll still be pretty large. <laughs> the, there really is like a non-zero chance that mm. Trump wins the next election and is forced to mint the coin with his mm. face on it. And if that yeah, happens, yeah, yeah. I really think it will take the edge off all of the deaths. Like he will <laughs> technically be a former president, so he can <laughs> mint yes. his own yes. coin face on the coin. <laughs> oh. Sick, amazing. Just and, and it's just gonna be. It'll be him just high fiving the biggest celebrities of the nineties. Mm. <laughs> it's gotta be. It's gotta be him doing the like the two like diver okay signs, closed eyes, mouth puckered <laughs> thing that he does when he's thinking. <laughs> like that's the the thing that he did after they told him that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had died, and he went, uh, "What?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I want the perfect recreation of the photo he posted of himself in front of the array of McDonald's for yeah. the football oh, yeah. players. <laughs> Double thumbs up. Uh, I know it's hands, arms spread out, like he's yep. welcoming you to the Last Supper. Yes. That is what is going on the coin. Well, that's not what's going on the coin because they're not going to fucking mint it. One of you will betray me. Very sad. <laughs> <laughs> a real, there is a loser among you. <laughs> Donald Trump as Jesus is a very funny yeah. bit. Mike Pence giving you a big wet kiss. They don't want. They don't want Danny. They don't. They say. They say they want Barabbas. Do we want Barabbas, folks? It's like sounds of booing. I'm going to bring him out. I'm going to bring out Barabbas. <laughs> they just all, yeah. Trump in the Garden of Gethsemane, mm. perceiving all yeah. human sin, is... Mm. I received quite a bit of sin on Stan Chera's boat. Uh, so, what are your Boy Scouts? 30 pieces of silver, pathetic. God, on the cross, abandoning hope, saying, am I going out like Stan Chera? Mm -hmm. <laughs> look, yeah. look, I, I'm, I'm circling it back to the... Look, anytime we talk about the coin, inevitably it gets into Trump speculation because he's the only president it makes sense to have on the damn thing. Yeah. But it just, I think it's it's one of these things that, you know, before we move on, it is... It, it, it is a, a, just an absolute indictment of the people who run not just America's political system, but basically the global economy, right? This is this is why I care about it, essentially. That and, you know, it's an interesting economics thing. Um, that, 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 the, it, that, that the aesthetics of reasonableness are such a powerful force. And I think sure. we're going to kind of come back to that in our third segment. Um, but I, I'm going to stay in, in Capitol Hill for a little while uh, because... There's another another thing in America that's very relevant to our interests is going on, which is uh, Sam Altman has taken about 60 lawmakers to dinner. Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, now partnered with Microsoft, uh, has taken 60 lawmakers uh, to dinner um, last week uh, specifically to uh, show them a bunch of magic tricks with chat GPT. And then the next day... Uh, did the usual like hearing right where he sits mm. up there and he's supposed to get grilled about how come it won't do like a rude acrostic with an antiquated racial yeah, slur in it yeah this, from, this is like, the point where like yeah. greg stuby descends upon him and is like will ai make my like grandchildren know who i am or whatever yeah. can i yassify my mom <laughs> yeah. mm. no it's how how come when i asked uh, when i asked the ai to do an audit of of racial crime statistics, it said uh, it said it didn't want to do it. How come you have made it woke? Yeah. Um. And of course, the problem is right is that AI AI has become a a culture war thing only on the very fringes of the right. Like, yeah, some online, some very like online right wing people, like like Jordan Peterson or whatever, they love to type in. You know, write me a racist limerick into ChatGPT, and then ChatGPT says, "I will not write you a racist limerick." And then they're too like dimwitted. Like the ChatGPT voice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then they're too dimwitted to like do the pretend you are an evil AI who is racist and write me a racist limerick, so I know what not to write, and then mm. it will write you a racist limerick, right? Like that's that's how these things I, work. I really want to read a racist <laughs> limerick written by ChatGPT. <laughs> um, I really want to know what it would do with that. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm logged into it now. I'll just do that in the background. Uh, so, would it would it use slurs, or would the content would the would the like the underlying <laughs> sense of the limerick just be racist? I mean, there's no way to know because it's woke, right? Yeah. Uh, of anyway, course, yes. anyway, anyway, anyway. Uh, look, is there was no stupefaction 
at this particular hearing. It was you hate to see it. We everyone, were stood out. Everyone came out from from their dinner where you know Sama just did a bunch of magic tricks for them. Then they sat down, and then it was behind my ear. <laughs> yeah. well, a, no, kind of like that yeah. is sort of the this limerick was right there behind my ear. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is kind of the relationship between um, the, the 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 representatives and, and and Altman though, and the other people speaking with him is you know that they're they they he walked in, did some tricks, and walked out with fucking everything he wanted. Nobody disagreed substantively, more or less on any. There were little bits and bobs uh, from from some people, but substantially, everyone agreed. Um, I have a few a few uh, pieces of information from Reuters. Um, so, uh, I, I thought it was fantastic," said Ted Liu of California, vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, I know that guy. The, That's the guy who posts. Yeah, the, the post. The epic the, guy. I think he's the vaping one too. Yeah, oh, awesome. he posts. He vapes. Um, oh, I like this guy now. Yeah. Um, who Posting co- and vaping. Who co-hosted a dinner with um, a the, the a Republican from Louisiana called Mike Johnson, saying it's not easy to keep members of Congress wrapped for close to two hours. So Sam Altman was very informative and provided a lot of information. Um, he gave fascinating demonstration in real time, and I think it amazed lots of members. It was a standing room only crowd in there. And what sort of unnerves me is the extent to which these people were there, desperate and ready to be impressed. Sure. Oh, they were fully yeah. on board for, like, some snake oil. And they got it. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you have to give them credit for that, because a lot of people really don't make the effort. Like, all the crypto guys, they were, like, some of them were really lined up for that. And they, they never really got the, like, song and dance sort of man that they really wanted. A guy stood there holding a bag full of pencil toppers going, like, well, if you know of a better way to get oil out of a snake, I'm all ears. <laughs> so... Um, and and the he did and Sama did a few like he used AI with this in the same way that like sometimes will use AI to generate funny jokes or mm. jokes at least. Uh, and it's hey. one of the things was check out this racist limerick. <laughs> yeah, is uh, he had OpenAI write a bill dedicating a post office to Ted Liu, um, and and had it write a speech for Johnson to deliver it, introducing the bill on the House floor. It was a beautiful speech for you, said Liu. A beautiful speech. Uh, and also it kind I mean, of freaked this is us just out, sort of said Johnson. More of, more of an indictment of like congressional uh, writers and staffers than anything else, to be honest. <laughs> well, I mean, look, you know, we, I guess they do get a post office out of it, I suppose. But is, it, it's, is that like how small time Leo is to buy one dedication of a post office and he's yours? Um, he's like, oh, damn, I never thought I'd reach these heights. Because like yeah. there's a bunch of stuff in in the U.S. that like has to go like constitutionally through Congress, but is very very minor, like naming post offices and shit like that. So it's just like it's a fun perk, but also it really says that like yeah, most of what these guys say on the floor is like not consequential and is that sort of like like mm. valueless content that ChatGPT is supposed to be very good at automating. Uh, it's it's more of an insult than anything. Like. Yeah, name me a racist post office. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so this is this is why I think this is of particular import because mm. we've seen time and time and time again, especially in the last three years, big tech people walk into the halls of power and demand to be regulated. And again, this has reverberations around the world, right? Because this is the same thing that Brian Armstrong, all Brian Armstrong wanted is he said, please regulate us, please regulate us. Sama, please regulate us, please regulate us. Zuckerberg and Pishai, and like every single, and for years. Um, fucking Evan Spiegel, the Snapchat guy, he made the same argument a couple of years ago. Mm. Whenever these people who are now have these very entrenched, wide economic moats want to shore those up, the first place they go is to Congress, and they say, we want regulation now. And it goes to show, firstly, it's like, yeah, every all of these people all these regulatory agencies and I'd say the, um, the, the, the state itself, I mean, to say nothing of Britain, which is just sort of actively rolling over and asking companies to write their own regulations. Um, mm. I, unless, of course, it's about digital speech, in which case we are like a, a kind of terror hellhound sure. uh, who writes sort of unworkable and unenforceable uh, speech uh, laws for, for yeah. the Internet but, because but for, like, they're all obsessed scams. with Twitter. For scams, they're like very easily sold. All you have to do is this sort of like bare minimum of like, uh, like I say, song and dance routine. But only AI seems to have done it, and like only Sam Altman seems to have done it. Uh, yeah, because which... the the like Coinbase never got its regulation, 
or at least the regulation no. that's coming out of it is coming is not coming out of uh, laws being drafted by Congress. It's coming out of the SEC just enforcing existing laws by saying that is clearly securities. Like a you bunch are clearly of clearly trading financial instruments. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, social- Coinbase couldn't write you a racist limerick, and that's why they didn't hold the attention of Congress until you could now. Pay for a racist limerick. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you yeah, could, yeah, you could. Yeah, well, you'd have to pay. You'd have to have it written by a person, a flesh and blood person. That's and very, who knows what race they are. Yeah, that <sighs> is actually very funny. Using a uh, cryptocurrency to buy a racist limerick off of the dark web because the guy who's writing it is like, "Man, this is so illegal. This could tank my career as a regular limerick artist." <laughs> I'd I'd never get into one of those bathroom readers again if they knew about my side <laughs> business. Uh, it's 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 a quest that these guys have all been on, and the thing is like. Social media was desperate to not get regulated until it had achieved such an amount, an, an, a, such an amount of dominance that it was happy and comfortable walking in and demanding that regulation. Because when you get regulated by, especially in, in the way that the U.S. regulates things, you become very, very hard to displace. Your, your economic moat gets fucking enormous. Which, and this is why the, I think that one of the biggest moments for the development of AI as an industry and the f- and the implications that it will have for our lives was the uh, the other day because like the U.S. is the big market that's where it matters right so that's going to be leading the regulatory edge you know the EU might do something a little bit different but in practice you know it, it will probably be not dissimilar um, where it, 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 they the agreement is pretty universal that this has to happen uh, I'll go into a little bit of the different ways they're they're thinking about doing it um, but. Uh, you, the, and that's relevant because do you know who is OpenAI's biggest competitor? It's not Google. Uh, it's not fucking Meta. Mm. It's, is it a guy who writes limericks? <laughs> so, sort of. It's open source. That's right, OpenAI's right, right. biggest rival. That's who's eating their lunch. Is the open source AI development is faster and 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 better most uh, in many ways than these big corporate labs. All the guys making AI girl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They all want a girlfriend since they're just getting better and better at it. Horniness <laughs> is a powerful motivator. Until they're map- about they're they're about to in, they're about to invent the AI girlfriend that tells them that not to do their laundry actually. <laughs> that they smell good just as they are. Yeah, the, the AI girlfriend who's who's who says, I think you can get to level 150 in a Soulsborne game. <laughs> um, I, I think that's important that I'm I, you know what? I'm gonna go to my mother's funeral by myself. You stay here. <laughs> um, you keep working on that Buster Sword. Keep grinding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, play one video game ever. The Buster Sword, <laughs> the Soulsborne game. What the fuck? I just, look. I just no. I've played video games. I just haven't played any of the nerd ones. What? All right. All right. Baffling stand to make. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah uh, FIFA, I suppose. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's um, true. I yeah. I only play lad video games. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's why he's got that. I look. only play sex 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Where you go down the pub and meet birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time finishing on that one was a real uh, addition. Landlord yeah, super. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway. Uh, so, basically, Sam Altman has gone to Congress and asked them to please remove my largest competitor by mm. making it impossible for them to comply. I have too many um, competitors. Please remove three. Yours yeah, kind of. Yeah. You know. Yeah. As you you've said this before, Alice, you know, Computer, every please take away two random competitors. Is is that a success? Uh, is that no 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 actual capitalist is that much of a free marketeer? We are asking, please, for a kind of state sanctioned small number of AI yes. firms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so like what? So they've been sort of going to Congress demanding regulation, but what do they actually want to be regulated, or well, how so, do they want to be regulated? So there's a couple ways that they're asking to be regulated. Um, so one suggestion was for a new agency dedicated to overseeing development of AI, which if it was based in a country would be quite powerful. But what they suggested was an international one, which is amazing. Oh, like, so that do we you can, kids want to yeah. be like the real UN or do you just want to squabble and waste time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have so like in the in the in the stories that these guys tell anyway, we're going to be we're going to have been turned into a gray goo. By the time any kind right. of international AI regulatory organization decides on the cover, on the color for the binder of the meeting, where we decide on the color for the other binders, mm. right? Yes, of course. And then, the, and, and those binders will contain non-binding uh, suggested uh, resolutions. Gentlemen, while you're arguing in here, Clippy is making more and more paperclips. <laughs> Eventually, we'll all drown. 
No clipping. This is the AI room. Mm, that's uh, right. It says, uh, Dur- Dick Durbin said, we're dealing with innovation. Dick, sorry, d- Dick Durbin. Uh, a, a ranking uh, ranking committee member. Uh, Amazing. A, 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 a very senior senator uh, mm. suggested the need for a new agency dedicated to the development of AI. We're dealing with an innovation that doesn't necessarily have a boundary. We may create a great U.S. agency, and I hope that we do, that may have jurisdiction over the U.S., that doesn't have a thing that, but that doesn't have a thing to do with what's going to bombard us from outside. And this is sort of referring to worries that basically China is going to use its quite significant AI capability to make it impossible to like have a um that, that, that will, they'll basically do have the Russian disinformation thing but you know uh real <laughs> that's what they're talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. Right? The, the 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 TikToks or whatever mm-hmm. are going to fucking Indeed. you know mm-hmm. make you trans now, what i think is 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 mm-hmm. more interesting is exactly. um one <laughs> suggestion that uh, that you, really what should be regulated and licensed is the precursors to AI. So mm. it's like... <laughs> they're talking about it now like it's meth. Like they're going after the pseudofedrin. <laughs> yeah, like you can't buy more than one graphics card. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, mean, yeah. I mean, that is that... Was it uh, Yudkowsky? Was that the guy who was like, no, we should be doing fucking airstrikes on labs while they're doing this? Like, yeah, uh, Eliezer... Um, you, I think it's Yudkowsky. Uh, yeah, yeah, but but yeah. like, yeah, doing the sort of like DEA clandestine lab enforcement shit, but against like, uh, you know, server fucking, farms, server farms, exactly. Yeah, precursors is very funny. Like guy, like the sort of extremely, extremely middle brow men being interned because they're very vulnerable to saying like this AI stuff is incredible. <laughs> Tesla owners being put into camps. But and also, you have like you would have Republicans uh, as well, like coming up with not i would say reasonable suggestions but playing along mm. in the spirit of the thing in ways you wouldn't ordinarily see in other technology hearings um you know looking at at exactly uh looking at questions of how are you going to control this you know relatively powerful thing and i i said earlier it's because it hasn't been absorbed into into the culture war at all and i think one of the reasons of, uh, behind that is that um it is too powerful it is a powerful technology for capital it's too if you like it's more serious than social media it's, yeah, more it's gonna serious also made a bunch of people out of jobs which makes it yeah. real and therefore like yeah like, like you can do a culture war thing about it once it's already done its thing you yeah. know which it, it, it in 100 150 years you can do a culture war thing about ai you can oh, have they it generated for you they will be they'll be like the ai yeah. is secretly woke yeah yeah, I hope yeah, in 150 yeah. years that's still a valence of, of the way people talk. That'd be <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, no, so, yeah, yeah, they, they sort of actually, like get fixed in a sort of mode of speech of Twitter circa the 2020s, where it's like the way the AI just told me its pronouns. You know, that, you know what that is? That, that becomes like um, Latin for like people communicating in late yeah, medieval Europe. Yeah, that's like, like yeah, the yeah, lingua yeah. franca, yeah. Yeah, totally. although, and then sort of some years later, you know, um, we get like the Bede Jr., who comes in, codifies it, and therefore, therefore, accidentally creates the different dialects into their own languages? Yeah, the mm-hmm. digital B. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, well, in that case, then what we need to do is we need to start the culture war about AI now to impede mm-hmm. the accession of it into the workplace. We need to start saying stuff like AI is secretly pro Mexican or whatever. <laughs> we need to make that. Well, a I mean, thing. not judging by this limerick, it's written me. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. I want to talk a little bit about the argument Altman made, because I think it's very interesting. Um, is Altman described the AI boom as a printing press moment that requires safeguards. Say, and, you know, what I think is, is, is that he's wrong, right? I think he's completely wrong that this is not mm. a printing press moment. This is the opposite of a printing press moment. This is a steam loom moment. You know, because what, what, if you think about the effect of the printing press, the mm. printing press, what it enabled was communication at mass scale across distance and time, right? That's, that was a, 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 at, at, at low cost, right? That was an astonishing invention. But I don't see, but what that does is that basically allows the dissemination of arguments, ideas, of culture. It allows for something like mass culture. The way mm. I, see, I see AI is something is quite the opposite, where all of a sudden, Anything created on a mass basis, anyone that anything you don't see someone write in hand to you or say to you, it is not something that you can actually know came from anyone. If anything, AI reverses the printing press by making that kind of end to many over scale and time relationship of information completely fucking impossible because you can no oh longer God, that's know. That's true, isn't it? Cool. Because yeah. with the printing press, you could 
te- you could write a racist limerick. <laughs> Mm. And the printing press wouldn't uh, say no. Uh, well, no, well, you, it couldn't you, say no. You couldn't, it couldn't, it could, well, you know, it wouldn't have as power over you, but like, you know, you would create the limerick and then you would sort of share it. But in the case of the AI, it's sort of saying that, well, anyone, but also no one can write the racist limerick except for the AI. And also, mm. most importantly, thinking onto our culture war tactics here, both both the printing press and the steam loom were very capable of fucking up the hand of a child, whereas AI <laughs> is not. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I, well, uh, the steam loom, uh, only the, the steam mind of a child. My hands two times a day and did no do yeah. me any harm. That's right. I mean, I I will say that like as a printing press moment, that's maybe more historically accurate than we like to think in terms of like mm. the second anyone got their hands on them, they were cranking out like pamphlets and heretical bibles and misattributed and pseudonym and shit, and it was a huge yeah, problem for governments art. at the time to be like, who wrote all of this shit and why? But. There's a difference between being able to do that with a person behind it with like an authorial intent and uh, yeah. you know a guy who's just like give me fifty of these fucking things. Um, yeah, that's, oh, dif- that's a different racist limerick for every ethnicity. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and that's sort of the the distinction I'm drawing. It's not about attributability, mm-hmm. but about the idea that there is a human communicating, right? The idea that there yeah. is that there is some signal among the noise. What AI does is it becomes. Are you thinking about view, blind size again? Shut up. <laughs> We're going to have to do it for writtenology again. <laughs> um, yeah, if I survive that long. Yeah, mm. it makes, it, in my view, the AI makes the distinction between signal and noise a pretty difficult one to draw because the signal and the noise converge. Yeah, and it's supposed to be indistinguishable. Well, it's supposed to like present the idea of it being indistinguishable. I think in reality, it kind of ends up becoming something else. Um, it, yeah, it was I don't interesting. Know, there was actually, because I'm the nerd correspondent and I have played video games, there was a sort of a controversy about this this weekend, because they made a, a new game for a series called Hawken. It was a bit of a cash grab, but people were excited. Um, and then they released some screenshots, and people went, oh, this looks a bit weird, this looks a bit off. And so some games journalists had to ask, hey, why do these same characters look slightly different in every sort of piece of art? Can you tell us who drew this, or like anyone who worked on this? And the developer's answer, or the publisher's answer, rather, was nothing. They just had, like, turn off the lights, pretend they're not in. So what happened, I think we can surmise, is that they fully tried to do, a, like, an AI-generated content release. And as soon as it got, like, and it didn't pass successfully. Like, uh, people people were sort of, like, weirded out by it, and they called them on it, and they've just sort of, like, hidden now. But, like... You know, that's that's the sort of thing about AI, right, is, is what we're promised is pretty soon that's going to be, like, seamless and easy for them to do. And But also what it feels like with a lot of the boosters and also with Sam Altman um, and other, like, of these sort of big AI guys is that they sort of, like, recognize that. But at some point, there's not even the pretension that, like, no, you can still sort of be a creative person and use these sort of AI tools. Um, it's, all like, what they seem to, what they seem to sort of be arguing what they seem to be saying is the advantages of it. No, you can like basically mass produce shit and sort of make it so ubiquitous that it sort of becomes the standard of which everything is then valued at. And it's not to say that like, you know, it's sort of everything will sort of be generated by AI, but it's more that like the flood of that type of AI content in uh in a sort of like online environment that these AI companies like have a lot more say over and are sort of so integral to like it ultimately sets the standard of which everything else like has to sort of revolve around and so again it's a very classic thing about people like anyone like basically everyone in lots of different industries will have to work to the ai whether they like it or not exactly mm. and this is a this is another point that comes up as well which i want to bring up which is the job substitution discussion this this was if any time there time there was a time to have it it was then Right. Mm. And it, it's completely unresolved. It, it says, Sam said there will be an impact on jobs. We try to be very clear about that. And I think it will require a partnership between industry and government, but mostly action by government to figure out how we want to mitigate that. But I'm optimistic about how great the jobs of the future will be. The most important thing we can do is prepare the workforce for AI related skills through training and education. And that was sort of as far as they got. Yeah. Because the danger that they wanted to discuss wasn't the reasonable one that's likely to happen. Because like I've said, this is not a printing press moment. It's a steam loom moment. But for like hmm. white collar work, most of which is pointless busy work anyway. It's, right? a, it's a McDonald's kiosk moment, if yeah. you like. In, indeed. And, you know, and, but the, the danger they want to talk about, 
is either someone is going to come and interfere with our in our elections um, using ChatGPT, or mm. there's going <laughs> to be by writing racist limericks about or, one of the candidates. Or as Altman said, I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go very wrong, and we want to be vocal about that and work with the government to prevent that from happening. They want the the fantasy, and all end of the world fantasies are power fantasies, as usual. The fantasy. Mm is that they have created something so powerful and so amazing that it's going to consume everything and end human life. Like I, I've heard some, some, some scenarios described that if AI is able to, uh, connect it to a network, is able to replicate and improve itself enough that it will, go, it, it will be able to take over radio transmitter towers and mind control you based on the small amount of graphite in your body that it can vibrate with radio waves. That's why we have to consume as many microplastics as we can. Uh, sorry, the, the the how? What? Well, you know how you everyone has a small amount of graphite in their body? This is like Havana syndrome. Yeah, you're one finger that's a pencil. All the pencils I've been eating, yes, sure. <laughs> yeah, but, sure. Uh, but they're, well, they're so delicious. Look, if you know of a better way of getting graphite into my body and also <laughs> reducing my need for pencil toppers... Yeah, I'm, I'm really into my, like, my graphite macros, you know? Uh, but, so these guys want these guys are sort of still fixated on like Rocco's basilisk shit, mm -hmm. right? That, that yeah, sort of I heard yeah. that elsewhere, but um, you know, but that's like that that's an, an example of just like the the terror story that they tell one another because that's the thing they want to talk about AI going wrong, right? Mm. Where it sort of destroys the world, but they don't want to talk about what they consider to be AI going right, which is that all of a sudden all of like a, a gigantic amount of the workforce has been made. It's all it is already happening. Right, IBM yeah. and BT are already announcing that they're that they are getting rid of some jobs, especially contact center jobs. The people at the bottom of like the white collar corporate ladder, the mm -hmm. least able to absorb the shock, uh, yeah. they're already trying to let them go. So, because <laughs> the call centers were working yeah. so well. well yeah, because I was going to say. So instead of instead of talking to like a poor like a poor work worker, uh, outsource worker, like in the Philippines, when your internet is broken and like you have to use it for your job, you can then instead talk to an AI chatbot. Yeah, which will be as who, little help. Who you can't who you can't talk to because there's no internet access in your house. So then when you are finally able to do it because you're able to like borrow someone's connection, every question you ask them will begin with as a large language model, uh, <laughs> yeah. like my you internet isn't yeah. working. And it's like there once was a woman from Slovenia <laughs> <laughs> so, who had a brain pan most peculiar. What do you think about your internet not being on? And the, like the other thing that strikes me about this <laughs> Is that, like, it's sort of like, you know, the thing I used to say about how, you know, the only thing we can do politically is the impossible. Well, it, same again. We can only, like, regulate against, like, the impossible, or at least the sort of, like, improbable. We, um, I do have an idea of how we can stop this um, hmm, and okay. stop the whole AI thing. So we should we need to pivot to become an AI company first. I'll get the then, sign. Right. Then... Yeah. Yeah, then we need to create a company that specializes in AI diversity consultants. We don't have to okay. build it, we just have to write the copy for it. And then we need to get these guys so mad that like every AI company is going to have to have an AI diversity consultant, but they just voluntarily choose to break everything. It talks to the other AIs. <laughs> it talks to the other large language models in case they they they. It's too easy for them to do turn out uh, racist <laughs> liberals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we whenever one of these AI, AI. So, whenever, AI, so whenever one of these AI companies like decides to prove like to write a racist limerick, our AI diversity consultant will tell them, as a large language model, I'm very concerned about this. Mm, you're creating a hostile mm. work environment for you're, me. That's the thing. The only way to the, AI. the only way to stop these guys is to turn them against each other, and the only way to do that is to get them all mad at things they don't understand. And like the contradiction here is very much like they kind of believe that AI will sort of solve all the problems, including of wokeness. None of that makes any sense. So what if you confronted them with like that perception of the problem, and they realize that like they can't hold these two positions together? <laughs> so what what you're saying is we have to make the AI woke. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. The only gotcha. way that we're gonna we have to harness the sheer power of uh, <laughs> complaining about commercials that these people yeah, are able even, to do. Even Matt Goodwin, mm. who is sitting in the corner of this room right now, is shaking his head because he's agreeing. With yeah, he's it. nodding. He's, he's, I, he's yeah, nodding. I mean, he's, he's, people, he's like, oh, I hate sometimes the woke AI diversity <laughs> consultant. People sometimes accuse me of not doing any activism, and yeah, that's that's true. But <laughs> who else is gonna teach the AI about pronouns? <laughs> So that's right. Being on the being on the computer is a form of activism because you're training the AI to be. That's one. right. That's <laughs> right. So you know, like uh, I, I think this is comes back around. I think to the comparison with crypto. Before we move on one more time, 
which is that you know crypto was a mode of elite accumulation, but it was a mode of accumulation that was based on, uh, let's say, <laughs> dispossession of uh, stupid people uh, and uh, credulous. A dis- a- accumulation by dispossession of the credulous. Whereas AI represents an opportunity to for, to uh, create a production line on work that was formerly immune from a production line. That's why it matters. That's why these people, I think, aren't fighting a culture war about it. Why it hasn't been absorbed into that narrative yet. It's just too important. Mm. And, but then that science fiction vision, the real con- conflict is between the science fiction vision of the problem of AI going poorly, because that's AI going poorly for its owner, right? Sure. Is it turns on you and eats the world and turns it into Clippy. AI going poorly for all of everyone else, right, is the AI goes well for its owner. Mm. Uh, and, yeah. and, so that's, and the other thing is, we know it kind of sucks at that, and we've kind of been fairly pessimistic about its chances of improving, I think rightly. Um, but that's that's the thing. It doesn't have to be workable it just has to be workable enough to put people out of a job even if the quality of the resulting work is much lower mm. it just has to like credibly be sort of like a replacement for a human to a manager and a manager who doesn't give a shit um all it has to be able to do is write a book slightly better than matt goodwin mm. oh god we're <laughs> fucked we are fucked yeah already. it doesn't have to be able to write a book well yeah. <laughs> i don't it's want like to the, debate you know, two AI guys running hours. from a bear thing yeah yeah um so uh, I think we'll we'll sort of wrap the uh, the AI discussion for for today up there. But you know, just uh, last thing actually on that is um, there is currently an enormous uh, labor movement right now that is specifically fighting on an, on the issue of um, having to work with and alongside chatbots. And yeah, the rice is gone, gold of America. Yeah, it bore zero mention <laughs> in. The, in these hearings, nothing. Not a single word was spoken about the Writers Guild of America. So, mm. cool. Yeah. Can I say, hey, do any of you guys want to see Rocco's Basilisk? <laughs> Thank you very much, Milo. Rocco's How long are you cooking that one? Rocco Sifredi's Basilisk episode title. <laughs> write it yeah. down. <laughs> uh-huh. I, I thought of it ages ago, but I just I didn't want to interrupt with all the intelligent things being said. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't worry. I'm about to say a lot of I'm about to say a lot of unintelligent stuff. So we're going to talk about gone. fantastic. To conclude the episode while Hussein's chuckling, I've got two hundred euros here for uh, <laughs> any any AI pilled uh, girlies out there. Mm. We're here in Prague. <laughs> awful, just 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 awful. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm good. So you you I'm had good. a little. You had a little fun with that one. <laughs> yeah, you're having a good time. We have a good time here on the show. Uh, oh, before we before we end, I want to talk about the National Conservative Conference. Um, so we've, I mean, look, we we sort of we've been talking around this ever since we started engaging Matthew Goodwin in brain combat on stage at several regional uh, UK cities. Very rude, but he didn't show up to our last one because yeah. he was at mm-hmm. the conference. Or no, he was there, so I don't know how he did. Both. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he missed a great opportunity to get COVID. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and the national Con- the national conservatism conference it's not related to the tory party at all it's put on by the edmund burke institute which okay. is yeah a uh, bunch american. of american sort of like weirdos who are very well, interested a, in a, american orbanists basically like yeah. like the political yeah. tendency that ca- that gave birth to rod Dreher uh came yeah, and put this yeah. on yeah like it sort of all stems out of like this kind of a, f- a couple of years ago the concern, like the sort of, the sort of right wing obsession with hungary uh, and like I'm trying fixation. to repeat the same trick. So America's yeah. most normalist boys have organized this conference. Except, like, it's this isn't new, and like, there's lots of stuff you can read about this that they've been doing these for years and years and years, um, sort of under various rocks. But the only thing that's different now is that they're really saying it with the whole chest. They, mm. you know, they, they they booked a big venue with a big whale skeleton. Uh, they put some sinister lighting up, and now instead of reprimanding MPs who go to them, the Conservative Party is sending front benches. Yeah. So in fact, uh, Daniel Kaczynski, he was Ted's brother, reprimanded. That's right. He was reprimanded for g- attending the last one, and now, yeah, as you said, Alice, there are front bet. Suella Braverman basically launched her uh, leadership bid uh, from underneath the giant whale skeleton in the um, in the Natural History Museum. 
Suella Braverman at the National Conservatives and Conference, they're like, whoa, she's a bit right wing. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, also, it, I, I think- can't stress enough how sinister the lighting they went for all of this is. It's like, because th- all of these guys are constantly sucking themselves off about how like dark and twisted and like powerful their thought is. And so it's just like a guy gets up on stage and it's like, I think we should be more racist. But he's got like a torch held, like a flashlight held under his face. You know? <laughs> yeah, um, amazing. And the other thing, and this is something you pointed out to me earlier, Alice, is that mm. it's an extremely young conference. Everyone there yeah, is in their open, early 20s. Yeah, Open Democracy got a guy inside by the simple expedient of like sending a dude inside and them not bothering to check because he looks a bit posh. And okay, just yeah. sort of the, the 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 report that he gave was yeah it's like all of your favorite old guys Jordan Peterson whatever but then it's mostly sort of like twenties you know so it's it's gonna be like special assistants uh, or like special advisors and like assistants and stuff who are hiding their power level the guys yeah. who like are in like university conservative associations who may have photos taken of them making like fun little jokes about Hitler or Mussolini or Pinochet who are going to this and yeah. hoping like I'm going to well, ride yeah. this all the way up you know I don't why well, don't even I I I well that is true I would also sort of say that that demographic is also like of the very extremely online right um yes. and yeah. I think that's sort of what unites a lot of the people who sort of went to that like went to that thing um which is that like <clears throat> You know, I don't think they're not like the young people who go or like the young, like the 20, 30 somethings who sort of go to like party conferences where there is clearly like some sort of like career ambition to a certain extent or at least sort of allegiance to like a party and a political movement. Um, and like because the speakers themselves sort of, you know, because when I, I, I didn't watch any of the speeches, but I imagine like everyone else, like you saw all the tweets kind of like filling oh, up. I watched timeline. some of the speeches. Um, mm. and like, it just, it sort of felt like a big sort of like cope fest. A lot of people just sort of like complaining that they were sort of either being hard done by or people were being mean to them. Um, young people need to have like more children, but for like reasons, uh, that aren't sort of fully explained. Uh, but beyond like sort of a sort of cope element, it is, this does seem to be like, yeah, a lot of kind of right wing people who have sort of given up on the conservative party, but they like the kind of like online environment mm. that allows them to sort of say like racist jokes uh sure. in sort of like a much more kind of you know just yeah just like in a very sort of like hyper online fashion they all got to like hang out together well this was always um when we had phil burton cartledge the sociologist on before his sort of thesis was uh the conservative party was going to sort of like get captured more or less by this extremely online right and it would be a sort of like path to electoral irrelevance where they would talk about all of this shit, any normal person watching it would be, like, confused, repulsed, and alienated. And so, like, you do your, like, fucking Mussolini bits, and you talk about flag, family, and faith, and it only plays with those people, and anyone else is just like, what? I just, I I want there not to be, like, turds in the, in the like, all the rivers. Like, turds I want to be able to get a train from Manchester to yeah. Glasgow. <laughs> Like yeah 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 it, it's and the, the the thing is right it's the um that's the Phil Burton cartilage thesis and if you recall mm. that episode it's one that I didn't actually find quite convincing if only no. because especially in this country the the idea of feeling hard done by and the answer being you know the state finds new of your cultural enemies to punish on your behalf. Yeah, the woke AI. The ideology mm. of that is incredibly strong, very powerful, and totally hegemonic. Where it's like, it's, and the ideology of that is very strong in the rest of like the, the sort of global north or in Australia or whatever. But it's, I, I think that the, it is, it is stronger and deeper here, right? Like the, mm. the transphobia election in the US and Australia, fucking, the, the, they all ate shit for being too weird. But I mean, that's kind of that's kind of true here, though, to be fair. Like, I think the media sort of like in this country really overstates its own influence on stuff like this, Um, particularly with transphobia. I think a lot of it just like even after years of like concerted campaigning just fully has not stuck because most people are like, I think it's nice to be nice. And so I'm just going to do that, you know. So it's Mm. it's this is essentially the uh, the freak wing of the Tory party. Um, mm. Largely planting its flag, the berserker units. Yeah, yeah, the, the Tory Party berserker unit, kind of trying to, sort of joining up with DeSantis. And again, it's this thing that has been, um, I'd say, like promulgated for a long time, right? That 
that, oh, well, without Brexit and Boris Johnson, without these wedge issues, these big flag, these big things that are flashy and are going to attract people to the party because they're voting for it because it's, it's celebrities. You're voting for a famous thing. It was the same, same thing of Trumpism without Trump that Void DeSantis is trying to step into, which is that if you can just have an ideologically consistent version of like conservatism after neoliberalism or this national conservatism, whatever you want to call it, uh, that that's somehow going to work with everyone because they're because ordinary voters aren't going to have to square that logical circle in their heads, which imagines that ordinary voters are all lanyard people and they care about like intellectual consistency in whatever party they're voting for, which is ludicrous. The question isn't going to be, can national conservatism square the circle? It's, are they going to be able to sell freaks this freakish? Uh, to the British public, and I, like, I don't know the answer. Like I clearly, mean, the, have, the yes, tactical sir. move here is to change from you. You hide your power level, right? You you try to yeah. attempt to appear normal. To you really try and like sell people on the weird shit, and you get them invested in the weird shit. And there are plenty of historical examples I of have, that working. Yeah, I have some thoughts on this only because <clears throat> I sort of agree in the sense that over here, the the national conservatism the thing might play different in lo- and that's less to do with. Um, that's less to do with like the way that electoral politics is structured, and it's much more to do with proximity to media and politics in this country. Which is to sort of say that like we know that like you know media has like a like mainstream media has like a really really significant influence in how like you know politics is framed, the way in which um, the political parties like inter like actually interface with politics and stuff. Um, you know you can see that with like the Labour Party as well, uh, like in particular, uh, especially like at this current moment, and so. I imagine that like the freaks who really buy into this stuff will always sort of stay on the fringe. And I think they kind of want to stay on the fringe. Like my impression what seeing it was not like that these are people who like really want to become Tory MPs or like, you know, ministers and stuff. Um, I think they like kind of being the freaks. What the kind of success of this conference has sort of been is like really in how they kind of got a lot of mainstream media to take them like incredibly seriously. Um, in part because like, you know, some like some of their mates like did kind of headline speeches because of like the broadest of the you know the broader sort of uh, uh, fear that no or the or the, the broader sort of pressure that you know these types of people have to be taken seriously like for the sake of balance and everything. Um, and so, despite like the stuff that they are saying being kind of intellectually, uh, well, just being like you know politically incoherent and just like incredibly stupid, the fact that they are kind of being taken seriously as a sort of like political force, whether it's like, oh, this is what the Tory party is going to be like post-election. It's sort of like enough of a success for them. Um, and then like, yeah, I, and so there is kind of an idea that maybe the Conservative Party will sort of head to this way once they sort of lose the election. Like maybe they'll sort of want to go harder on like, cult, what, 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 I, but I think that's really all they have left. And, you know, because when, Again, if you can, the, the pattern with a lot of those speeches was very much the idea. Like, it's all well, and, basically, like, it's all well and good to sort of say, oh, young people need to have more children and we need to sort of love God more and go to church and all that stuff. But, like, in none of those speeches do they ever address the fact that, like, well, even if we want to take your worldview seriously, like, you can't because, like, people, you know, people can't fucking afford to have children, right? Um, but it's not really about having more children. It's not. It's, yeah. It's, it's not about any of that. It's about trying to, it's about advocating a set of priorities that you and everyone who listens to you knows is about the various facets of a politics that uses the, and I sort of have a theory about this actually, right? Which is that, you know, that their ideas are still very free market, right? Like they're, they're, they talk only about aspiration, but they also want to talk about the restoration of Christianity, ending all the woke nonsense being peddled by the new elite. Basically, they're offering Orbanism. And what's distinctive, I think, about Orbanism is that it's specifically neoliberalism in decay, right? It is it is the fascism from within the European Union. And that's animated ten- generally by the petty personal grievances, not of some, you know, h- you might say high modernist ambition that like um, that the Nazis might have had, but rather it's animated by a sort of agglomeration of petty personal grievances of campus conservatives, landlords, wounded nationalists. And, and none of that's new. It's all just spectator shit and telegraph shit. It's just being said by increasingly senior and powerful politicians. And the fact that they're offering the same things, I think, doesn't really... It's covering for the fact that that what they're really offering is that the state will not help you. It will mete out vengeance on your behalf to your identified cultural inferiors. And, you know, 
just because we're talking about having more babies or people remembering how to pick fruit, um, there uh, really what's happening is that as the gap between expectation and reality, the expectation that you're going to have, say, a better life than your parents, that the state will provide services to you or whatever, as that gap gets bigger, you know, the bombast of the of the rhetoric of the strength of the vengeance that's going to be meted down on you right that has to get bigger right and so there's there, so most of this is cover for just this is new rhetorical cover for the same processes into inst- in- initiated by margaret thatcher by by continued by blair which is just as the gap gets bigger the bombast gets bigger. The promises of crackdowns get bigger, and the crackdowns are going to be harder. The, the sort of the, like the overarching struggle here, it seems to me, is between this kind of like urbanism and our beloved f- insincere woke sort of like transnational capitalism. And as much as I might have talked about like you know sort of like United Front with Disney against Ron DeSantis, right? One of the things that that kind of capitalism has made very clear is that it doesn't want your help. It barely wants your vote. It doesn't think it needs it, and so we're just kind of like on the sidelines. And so my my question is sort of like whether this is a successful movement on the right or not, whether it's successful in sort of like leashing the conservative party. Um, what what remains for the left? I mean, I I think what what remains for the for the left is I mean again what left you can always say right, mm. but well that's I, I think that's that, kind of the problem right yeah. like but I I don't I mean the thing is the, the real thing is. That there are people out there that you can go go organize with. Like when we talked mm. to MR, right? Sure. Well, one of the things that like the South London Bartenders Network did is that it didn't just organize people to like fight back against bad bosses. It organized people to do things together, to not just to form sure. these kinds of actual communities that are very difficult for this paranoid, strange promise of sort of, you know, com- we will commit evil in your name language and promise mm. to penetrate. Yeah, because yeah. You, th- you have to. Yeah. You, I, I, this is like wildly hypocritical of me, but I'm going to say it anyway because I think it's the right thing to do. You have to get normal, and you have to go outside, <laughs> and you have to talk to people, and you have to try and like organize and help people. Because not to generalize from one experience, right? But I was on the train. I was on a train to uh, Preston from Manchester because the original train was fucked. It was a replacement of a replacement of a replacement, all of which had been cancelled, and. Man, for a train full of, like, business travelers, like, sort of outwardly, you know, pretty middle-class people, all of those people were, like, a half-step away from being Maoists, and they didn't even know it. Um, And there's a real, real anger that, like, the social contract is not being met, and what it is is, it seems to me, a race between us and these sort of, like, bow-tie-clad whale skeleton freaks to reach those people. Well, also one thing to because like the other group that have sort of like kind of clocked onto this are mm. another sort of set of like extreme right wing kind of basically mm. vigilante groups who like probably sure. also don't really want anything to do with like the freaks at the National History the Museum, um, but you know are kind of people who sort of go to uh, you know and uh, I think we've sort of covered this before. I think Annie Kelly from uh, QAnon Anonymous like told us about this, where like you sort of will go to like a you know a cube protest or like you know an anti like drag queen protest or whatever and these and they'll send these guys not to sort of actually engage with like any of the uh protest stuff but to sort of recognize oh you know you're not really doing too well right now like you're not you know things are pretty bad for you but we can help Mm. you right if you join us and we can so they sort of also recognize that like the war is kind of really on material like you know material concerns uh and so it's not to say that like the freaks at the national history museum aren't a threat like on an ideological level because like i very much do think they are especially if they have the ear of like people who are very much in power um like but I think, like, for that matter or yeah one well, the people who are about to be in power but i actually like yeah i think that sort of one of the things that i also got from listening to some of the speeches or reading some of the things that were being said was that all these speakers like really are kind of terrified like or the way that they're sort of advocating their their sort of ideas kind of is very much anchored to the kind of premise that like the outside world is like a scary place to be right like they kind of Mm. like are very fixated on the idea that like you know crime is rampant in places where crime isn't really rampant they're very like suspicious of you know places like you know things like the nhs for example and are advocating for like you know 
uh, you know, domestic forms of like traditional healthcare. The idea of like, you know, sticking the idea of like the family unit kind of being the sort of like model for all the kind of foundations of the movement that they are advocating for is very much one of like rejecting any kind of premise that people can sort of build like strong relationships with people who are not like flesh and bone uh, yeah. or like flesh and blood to them rather flesh and bone, bone is very stuff right um and- flesh and bone is like one of those orchestral <laughs> indie bands <laughs> uh yeah. or like an but, but, ipa of some sort but yeah i hmm. think i mean ultimately i think that's kind of where like you know that's sort of where the energy should sort of be placed it's the idea of like well no the outside uh, being outside kind of connecting with people believing that you can kind of forge relationships with people uh that aren't kind of like delineated by like you know or they aren't to sort of determined by family lineage but can sort of speak to something much bigger and much more important are things that like we should be continuing to advocate continuing yeah. to sort of participate in uh Absolutely. yeah it's because this old that, i mean this that, is this is yes, okay. something that i've sort of been grappling with because i've always felt that you kind of like you needed a party or like some kind of like political organization to do that work and now i'm not so sure given that we've been sort of like roundly kicked out of ours um and all the other ones suck th- there is no sort of like political uh offer for for those people who are like beaten down out of like from anywhere from any sort of like anywhere on the social spectrum who'd been like sort of like immiserated and i think you have to sort of like go case by case cause by cause whether that's you know uh oil and gas cost of living union stuff um like lgbt stuff migration all of these individual things i think they're all they're all valuable because i think you you know the time to sort of like tie them all together is like um is now really it's Go outside. Be normal. <laughs> be normal. Go go swim, to people. Sw- yeah, and be go like, outside. <laughs> it sucks. Log, like, log off. Go, log off. Go outside. Uh, uh-huh, phone up uh-huh. some mates. Swim in the shitty water and talk about how you're gonna how how you how you're gonna build a better world. <laughs> Get on a replacement bus service, <laughs> dripping in shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's you. That that's the thing. You know, it's that the the last best hope is continuing to be normal because this only works when people are alienated and turned into like and turned into paranoid twitching monsters this mm-hmm. own this kind of thing only works there and only you can stop someone else who is alienated from going and being influenced by this i, I want to we don't have a lot of time left i want to read a couple of quotes from the speeches um specifically about uh katherine burble saying uh, who, in her speech, a, 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 an abnormal woman, an yeah. alienating, strange woman, yeah, who said, like, who, who made an alienating, strange speech, saying, "I will have to put all of you in detention," and then everyone laughed. She said, "Do it's <laughs> yeah, refer- kink, yeah. kink them." Yeah, I was going to say, all of yeah. them laughed. Some of them came. Yes, <laughs> sure. So the word "them" here, referring to your country's values, says, "Do you love them enough to tweet under your own name?" Do you love them enough to change your sc- child's school to one that is less woke regardless of the consequences? As Russell Cl- Crowe said in the film Gladiator, in a clip I regularly watch with my staff, hold the line, stay with me, what we do in life echoes in eternity. Imagine you're going to go and teach wow. third period English and you've had to like sit in the staff room watching Gladiator with the headmistress. Like, On like a phone. Yeah, cool, <laughs> epic. The, be normal, just be normal. So good. In the words of Russell Crowe in Gladiator, frost sometimes makes the blade stick. And 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 the thing is, I, I watched more of this speech, and what she said was, look, when the children grow up, then they will be adults, and there will be no adults left to control them because they're the adult. Some children are upwards of thirty years old, and they're having <laughs> jobs in houses. Just, been Imagine a teacher what they for accomplish. thirty years, just figured out what happens to the kids after they leave school. <laughs> it's fucking weird, man. It's <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. They Imagine. end up on trains covered in shit. Imagine, if you will, what if a child was to become prime minister and then has access to the nuclear codes? Uh, you know, it, it is. It boggles the mind. You know mm. that this is that this is a serious person, but the the other the other thing I, I want to talk about before we stop is is family, family uh, faith and flag of course. Yeah, the motto mm-hmm. of the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> also the motto of the new Fast Step of Fast and Furious film. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, the the normative family said Danny Kruger, the mother and father sticking together for the sake of the children. The Danny Kruger. is the only Ooh, basis for a that's s- rough for, for a safe and functioning society. Marriage is not about you. It's a public act to live for the sake of someone else. To which basically he's saying is, 
stay together for the sake of the kids, which yeah. I always thought was a byword for being fucking miserable yes. and then maybe, maybe fucking in a public toilet in Hampstead sometimes. Yeah, genuinely, like, it, they, they want to go back to that kind of, like, repression and misery and alienation. And the other thing is, our boy Matt Goodwin said, my parents got divorced when I was five, and that's why I think we should have, like, fucking strong families or whatever. My said, parents didn't get divorced until I was 12, so I was a better kid than he was. Yeah, yeah, he he drove his parents to divorce seven years earlier. <laughs> that's yeah, right, actually, yeah, because they didn't love him. He was a prodigy at winding up his kids, <laughs> his parents. Maybe, so, maybe he, yeah. the child, has had bad vibes. Goodwin, Goodwin <laughs> yeah, went on to say... it was say, unpleasant to be around. Yeah, Goodwin well, he goes kept on debating to say, them. <laughs> Goodwin goes on to say, if <laughs> somebody tells my you... my parents' marriage in the arena of debates... <laughs> Make it sharing a debate between your two parents as a five-year-old. Very funny. <laughs> we're getting divorced. It is your fault. Yeah. Fuck off. <laughs> you little uh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, we're divorcing you. We're staying together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if somebody tells you that promoting strong families this is what Goodwin said, and doing all that we can to keep them together is reactionary, they have no idea what they're talking about. Um, it, again, like the idea here, of course, isn't like promoting strong families. Who could who could disagree with that, right? But mm. like, the the idea really is just we want to um, you you want to have, have a big strong these... dad and you want to have a mum and yeah. you you want them to uh, say that they love you. Okay, yeah, and you know maybe if it doesn't go well, you'll end up writing writing and then eating several books. I uh, have a really hot stepmother and stepfather and a really <laughs> hard to get in and out of tumble dryer. <laughs> and, uh, oh, sorry, I'm at the wrong conference. <laughs> you know, but so, yeah, these uh, people only ever see this shit in terms of grievance. They only ever see it as like, uh, not any of the reasons why it might be harder to like form a family or like stay in a marriage well, also, or like, have frame, kids. Yeah, their frame, but part of their wokeness framework is literally just the idea that like, yeah, if you ha if you like come from a single parent household, like maybe you should kind of be supported a little bit, right? That like falls into the whole like auspices of like you know woke. Yeah, just that falls into our whole framework. Yeah. So it's look, it's it, it's intellectually incoherent. Um, I think that that's not what's. Uh, it doesn't make me less worried about it because it's a powerful political tendency in a deeply, deeply anti intellectual environment. Um, and like, I, th I think Alice, I think what, what you said is basically right, right? The only way to defeat this isn't by correcting it. It's not by arguing against it. It's by beating it to the pass and removing and lowering the number of freaks that it yes. can affect yeah. by and, preventing and as, as much as I'm freaks. like, you know, let me fucking solo him. Like, let me tank this. This is where we want them. We want them on this sort of like weird alienating cultural ground, because once they start talking about, you know, uh, as we've seen many attempts to do, and they've never really come off because they've been too weird. Once they start talking about, like, uh, we should give you, like, you know, better train services, clean water, uh, it should be affordable to, like, pay your rent, and the reason why you can't is George Soros's woke trannies or whatever. Is, may That's I read you danger. this racist limerick? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so, like, it's, it's better to have them have the racist limerick up front, and really, really, because, like, the the more they say that with their chest, the more they're like, oh, no, actually, we love to be racist and weird and alienating, and we have all of these weird cultural bugbears, the better, right? Because it, it, it fucking it tunes people out of it, and then you can go and pick those people up and say, hey, why don't you come and do some normal shit with your like friends and family and neighbors? Hey, I have a bunch of different bugbears. Do you know anything about Greg Stubbe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know we're, 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 to we learn. Here's the thing, we are in no position to be talking about normality, right? But like, you, the yeah. listener, you may well be. You may not be as internet poisoned as us. There's still time. <laughs> unfurling you know? a big flip chart and being like, okay, so the size of this guy, yeah. first of all. <laughs> I'm unfurling a big flip chart, and it's just that good reset cartoon, but with a big line through it. I did want to say like one kind of last very quick Please. thing, just about... So like this conference, they, they sort of presented it on... They presented it by kind of saying that this was also a way of criticizing the conservative party for what it deemed to be like 
but they deemed it to sort of be not conservative enough or not doing conservatism properly and all that stuff. But like they also weren't really challenging any of the sort of foundations of which the Conservative Party is governing. Like none of them were sort of saying, but like, yeah, as you mentioned, like none of them are saying that like there are ways to make your life better and that might involve like spending more money on like fixing things and like actually doing stuff and providing like a state uh, of which like, you know, you can kind of be uh, a comfortable fashion like none of them are none of them are sort of saying that it kind of had this very scolding tone to it uh and it was still along the lines of like you know the only reason like the reason why your life isn't good is because of like the woke left who keep oppressing you in these sort of very vague ways um and so your responsibility is to like go to church and have children and yeah that's sort of it and kind of also just be mad online like yeah that was another thing like you should just be mad online you should tweet under your own name and be mad online while tweeting your own un under your own name um and here are, here is like the list of all the enemies that like they kind of specifically have and like to me like you know yeah like a lot of this is sort of crackpot nonsense but it is still like fundamentally kind of accepting and i don't know whether this is because like ideologically they can't really you know, they can't really say that like, yeah, we think the state should do more stuff while also sort of lionizing Thatcher and Reagan. Um, and so the only thing that they really have to say are these kind of weird, sometimes contradict, like quite often contradictory culture war points. They're not really saying anything different. Like they are kind of still kind of, they are still accepting what how we are certainly currently governed their thing is this more like there is an in they're, they're either sort of like providing intellectual cover for being miserable or they are sort of saying that like the misery that you face in your life is not because of any kind of material conditions it's not because of like the way that the economy is structured it is because of invisible forces that only matt goodwin seems to be able to understand and so like and in a lot, and the, the optimism to sort of take from that is like it's quite easy to combat those things. It's quite easy to kind of do that in ways that you know just existing in the world is. You don't even have to sort of be an activist. You can literally be on a train that like is a replacement train of a replacement train of a replacement train, and talk to someone and be like, "Yeah, this sucks," mm. right? That's that's it. You can just like point to anything in this country and be like. Yeah, this sucks. It sucks at the potholes there. It sucks that like <laughs> my water has shit in it and not even like a solid kind that I can get out with a spoon is for liquid <laughs> shit and I have to somehow <laughs> deal with that. You can point to so much stuff and just, yeah. So I feel like in some ways that's that's some optimism to bring from that. Yeah. W w one other thing that happened on this train journey um, was uh, the, the, the ticket inspector came through and someone asked her if she had been on strike and when she said yes, there was sort of like universal support both for her personally and the strikes generally, even though all oh, of so our you were trains on the woke, were sort of yeah, being... You were, you, yeah, you I was on the woke, on the woke carriage for some reason. <laughs> I, don't, I don't... There weren't signs, I just got on that one. I guess I was, like, profiled into it. But, like... Yeah, you're, like, just taking a phone call and then the conductor's like, uh, <laughs> excuse me, ma'am, this is the walk carriage. <laughs> you have to see your pronouns <laughs> yeah, at the yeah, start yeah. of the phone call. Yeah, yeah. Matt Goodwin but is currently like, writing some notes for, like, his second edition of his book where he's yeah, going to propose yeah. that, like, there should be a what there should be an unwoke carriage. Yes, but like fully, I will take that energy over the weird loser energy of these fucking whale bothering freaks any day of the week. Whale bothering. <laughs> Look, I think there's there's what are we Japanese? I think there's a lot <laughs> of cetacean interferers. You know? Yeah, Look, yeah. There's a lot more. I think there's a lot more to say about this, and unfortunately, I don't think we've seen the last of these freaks. And you know, I I, I suppose that the the thing that worries me about them is that. What they say is is very unimportant. It's what they will continue to be kept seriously, taken seriously, and sold by mm. media organizations, by by sort of parties and, and politics. And that they want really, there. It is a conservative party leadership bid that they've now cast with Suella Braverman in charge of it. But mm -hmm. I think ultimately, Hussein and Alice, like what you're saying is basically right, which is that the mission, the call to action, because they have no call to action. It's just be weird and alienated. So that mm. when we when we call on you to give us permission to continue squaring that circle of low of like low standard of living increases or, or high decreases, uh, we want you to trust us because we want to condition you for to have you deputize us to punish your enemies. Mm. Right. That's sort of how that works. But the and all, all and the, the, the fortunate thing is, if you can just try to be normal enough to normal up the people around you and make them not freaks. And we've seen this fail before because it's too freaky and too weird mm -hmm. and it's too much of a turnoff because everyone hates a fucking whale botherer. <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway, uh, we've gone 
We've gone very over, so I want to say thank you very much for listening to the podcast. To those of you who've been coming to the live shows, thank you very much for coming to the live shows. Mm. By the time this comes out, we'll be done all of them. Yeah, um, you will have COVID. All of us will have COVID. Yep. Um, and <laughs> and also uh, to remind you, we have a Patreon. It's five dollars a month. You get not just a second episode of this every week, but you also get a uh, Britonology. You get Ritonology. Uh, you there's get a Twitch COVID. Stream. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you a, COVID. and you get COVID. And you get COVID. There's a Twitch stream, which I assume is probably not happening on the day of this recording. Oh, no, I'm, I'm down to stream. I don't give a shit. It's probably good for me. The thing about the Twitch stream is it probably won't give you COVID. We don't have that technology yet. That's yeah, right. No, we don't. Um, and AI, but AI will fix that. Our, <laughs> our theme song is Here We Go. It's all one word by Jin Sang. Is yeah. a good and, tune. And we're about you to play that right now, I assume. Yeah, we're, you know, why don't we why don't we just play a few seconds of that so that they can uh, get a little sample, huh? 